Rise, Tarnish, and welcome back to the neighborhood. On this episode, we are returning to the lands between so that we can enter the lands of shadow in pursuit of kindly Mikola. So hop on Torrent and collect as many skidoo tree fragments as you can <laughs> because it's time to talk about the massive expansion to 2022's Game of the Year, Shadow of the Earth Tree. Welcome to the podcast where two longtime friends and sometimes a guest talk about their favorite games from the perspective of an average player. My name is Andrew Kimball. And I'm Dylan Wren. And, and we, we are your friendly neighborhood gamers. And before we dive into this topic, proper uh, it's time to bring things full circle because we have a very special guest on this episode joining us to talk about this massive expansion for elden ring is dave jackson dave how's it going going great and uh, thank you guys for inviting me back yeah bringing it all full circle from uh from when we first talked about elden ring and it's good to talk with you both as always it's good to have you on. Been looking forward to this episode ever since we like kicked around the idea of doing it with you and then invited you on. I'm like, yes, we get to oh, yeah. have a nice little chit chat about a FromSoft game with Dave. Us, the three of us talking about a FromSoft game? Never. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's weird if we talk about anything else. Yeah. <laughs> So like uh, Dave alluded to, we have talked about some From Software together in the past. Uh, Dave invited us on his show, Tales from the Backlog. You may have heard of it. Uh, we talked about Bloodborne Bosses, I think was our very first mm -hmm. uh, collaboration that we did together. And then when Dave did his Elden Ring month, we were part of that talking about Elden Ring and open world games as a whole, kind of dissecting that topic. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. We've also been on there for a, a couple non from software episodes talking about The Witcher 2. And uh, I was on with Katie Shesko for Near Automata. All great times. It's, uh, it's always fun chatting with Dave. Yeah, absolutely. And um, again, just happy to be talking Elden Ring again with you guys. This is, uh, it's exciting. That, that open world discussion that we did, you know, talking about how From Software adapted their formula to an open world and kind of like their take on open worlds after open worlds like blew up in the industry. Now we get to like, we get a new From Software open world. It's like the same, but it's different. Uh, I, I'm excited to like dive into that specific topic too when we get into this uh, this episode. Yeah, yeah, because I'm sure we'll get into it more. But like, they took kind of like three open worlds and like stacked them on top of each other in this yeah. DLC. It felt like <laughs> yes. so they're still mixing it up with their uh, their game design. Mm -hmm. But um, if you've listened to either of our podcasts before, you kind of have an idea of how this will be structured. We're going to split this conversation, keep things spoiler free towards the beginning. And then in the back half, we will go full spoilers for, you know, what that means for FromSoft games is usually like boss names and surprises and things like that, more so than talking about twists and stuff in the story, because Vati hasn't released enough videos yet, so I still don't <laughs> fully know. Although I do feel like Elden Ring is a little bit more clear cut than some of their older games, but uh, that will be the structure. So we're going to dive into our spoiler free thoughts here. There will be a music break before we go into spoilers and then uh, timestamps so you can come back to our verdicts at the end. With all that being said, this DLC, uh, you alluded to it, it's another big open world open area you you enter it through a loading screen you you kind of get like teleported to it and they drop you in this little corner this like little river kind of closet area so that they can give you that big reveal you walk through that pathway and you come over the hill and you see like the land of shadow with the the shadow tree and everything in the on the horizon and and again it Similar to the base game, it's just like, dang, they they nailed these vistas. 
Yeah, that was like, it was like the first impression. Like you said, like you get out, you get that vista of the tree and you've got all these, you know, you've got these weird swirls up in the sky coming off of the tree out into the distance and stuff. And it's your first example of many of like jaw dropping, beautiful vistas in this game. I have so many screenshots from, uh, from playing this, like more than the base game almost. It just really felt like, you know, they have like less areas to work with than the base game. So they're just like, okay, put all that, that same effort you put into the base game. Now, just like you have less things to work on. So make them all stunning when you see them. And that first time you get out into what's called gravesite plane or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the first of many. Well, they do such like an excellent intentional job of like sort of setting the vibe for it where it's just like Mm -hmm. you, the you know, like you come up over that hill and it's similar to like a Breath of the Wild experience or the original Elden Ring where you kind of like you see a couple of the like you see one of the big fire golem things kind of wandering off in the distance and you're like oh, okay i can go fight that eventually and then you know like <laughs> y- you see this like shadowy castle kind of way out there and another sort of shadowy thing you know like they do such an excellent job of being like hey look over here this is going to be something interesting go explore it you know and i just love that about this game like i know a lot of people talk about having those moments with Breath of the Wild, um, and that was like Elden Ring for me, and it continued in this DLC. Yeah, I think part of that too is like, this is only on next gen, so like you couldn't buy this DLC on PS4, as far as I know. So interesting. Yeah, I think so. So I might be I might be talking out of my ass here, but um, <laughs> the fact that they can like design purposely for next gen means that they can like know that you'll see things further away i think and there's a bunch of parts in this dlc specifically where like you get out that door into the gravesite plane if you take a right and go over to the cliff you'll look down you'll see the big dragon down there in the dragon pit and it's super far away you're not going to get there for a really long time but you can see it and like i i think if you've well you have played this far to get to the dlc you played enough of this game to know like if I see something really cool out in the distance, I'm going to go there at some point. So they're like planting all these seeds of, you know, cool stuff in your future. Well, I think the world being, it's smaller than the base game because the base game is, was also extremely diverse, but you would spend so much time in one zone that you kind of would like get used to the the look and feel of it. Whereas like you said, in this you can kind of look down or look up and and see future zones because everything is closer together and more mm-hmm. like vertical. And I think what they did with that, instead of being like, hey, you see that thing far away, you could get there if you like, you know, ride long enough or whatever. With this, they're like, hey, you see that thing up there or down there? Try to figure out how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and there were so many moments where like you'd, ride through somewhere or like be exploring like way past like way later in the dlc and you'd wind up kind of like circled back to like uh like in the very first zone there's like this river that sort of runs through it and the way you get down into that river really there's like two two entrances in like later zones um that you can kind of get through and so I remember kind of like circling back around and being like, oh, this is that river that I was like looking down, trying to figure out how to get into in that very first zone. And, you know, like everyone talks about FromSoft sort of like way that they circle things back on like circle levels back on themselves, like in the original Dark Souls and stuff and and create kind of like shortcuts and that sort of. And this DLC really feels like they did. They blew that out to like the full map kind of yeah this is the closest they've been to the world design of dark souls one since then um you know i think a lot of us from software fans like marvel at the way dark souls one is designed where it's like this this cylinder basically and all the levels connect with each other in weird ways and you'll go through four or five levels and get on an elevator and wind up back at you know, the the beginning zone or something like that. And they've never really done that again. Um, 
It kind of the closest before this, I think, was probably Bloodborne, but Bloodborne's not really like that. It's just like things loop back into Central Yarnum every now and then. But yeah, right. in this DLC, it is stacked on top of each other, like like you said, and we have all these different places that connect, and you'll go in one place that's seemingly not related and you spend 45 minutes in a catacomb and then you come out and you're like, oh, I'm at this place that I saw 25 hours ago and wondered how I was ever going to get there. Now I'm here. And then you like explore that zone and you might find a way back up to the starting area that you just didn't know about before or something like that. Um, Like I, I get why they've never fully tried to recreate the world design of Dark Souls 1 because it's probably super complicated and hard to do. But this is the closest, and yeah. it gave us all those awesome moments all over again. And and something too that I want to throw out there is we're talking about this DLC like it's small, like we're in comparison <laughs> to like Elden Ring. But it is it is as like if if Elden Ring hadn't come out, let's say Elden Ring came out second, and this was like kind of the first thing, this would still feel like full size game to me. Oh yeah, how long did it take you guys? I didn't keep specific track and there were points where I jumped back out into the main game to like go get something or like just continue progressing there for a little bit. But I played it over at least a couple of weeks to to fully beat it, I think. And I want to say at minimum like 30 hours at minimum Mm -hmm. but probably more than that all all said and done yeah mine was higher than that but like because i i made a character in the base game earlier this year to kind of prep for the dlc to like make a cohesive build to go into the dlc with because i didn't want to try to just like use my cobbled together first playthrough character that was at (laughs) end game and so I think when I jumped into the DLC, that character was somewhere around 40-ish hours, Mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that file is like over 100 hours now. Yeah. Yeah, mine was uh, 45 hours spent in the DLC alone uh, consecutively. So it is, as you were saying, it is basically its own open world game. Um, It is just you know, end game difficulty and a new progression system related to that end game, like level that everyone's going into it at. But like the size of it, the amount of bosses, there's like, there's like 40 bosses in the DLC. It's like an insane number of things for, for a DLC. And so you see why it took them two years to make it. Uh, because, and it wasn't like, you know, they're just working slowly or something. They're just making yeah. an entire open world game as the DLC. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of like when people talk about Blood and Wine being yeah. like essentially its own game. And it's like, yeah, this I, this falls into that category that is maybe just Blood and Wine and Shadow of the Erdry. I don't know how many other like DLCs essentially qualify <laughs> as their own game. And people yeah. would probably like maybe Far Cry uh blood dragon or something like that maybe i don't remember if that was dlc or not but like very not a whole lot that i can think of that it's basically like yeah like it's cool and all that this is dlc but like people probably would have paid full price for this so yeah yeah like i think like if uh if they if they used a different progression system like if they just like started you from level one or something and then just released this and like scaled everything of course yeah and then just released this as elden ring 2 i don't think a lot of people would bat an eye maybe some people would be like this is only half as big as the hundred hour yeah yeah <laughs> base game but like in a vacuum it is it is basically you know the size of an open world game there's so much yeah yeah i mean it is well, and that's why in the base game we kept going, there's more because yeah. it felt like there was just so much and it was all high quality. Like, you know, towards the end, I remember getting a little bit tired in the base game and just being like, okay, how, like, is there an end to this game? But in, <laughs> but like on replays and stuff, like, it's all so good. And I tried to, like, on this most recent replay, I kind of sped through the first part of the game and focused more like slowed down towards the back half because i couldn't hadn't like 
sat in that part of the game as much and it's it's all great and it, it that amount of quality content is is ridiculous and so the dlc being another large slice of that is yeah it's it's crazy it, it, it's i've been trying to call it an expansion yeah just for my own like vernacular because saying dlc feels like it's selling it short yeah, <laughs> for yeah. what it is it feels like you're talking about like some armor cosmetic armor yeah. for <laughs> horse armor or something yeah. maybe, maybe a level or something yeah. like that yeah yeah the like rock steady you know play for 45 seconds as catwoman <laughs> dlc <laughs> that they they used to do back in the day yeah uh dave you've mentioned it a couple times the progression system in this expansion so they wanted to kind of level the playing field for people going into this they didn't want people with their broken end game characters to just be able to bum rush the DLC and just d like destroy it all in one day. So their solution to that was we're going to kind of level everybody out when they enter and then to increase your damage output and your defense only in the DLC area, only in the shadow of the earth tree, you will find these fragments, <laughs> these scadu tree fragments <laughs> that will boost you. And then they also had some like ash, I can't remember what they called the ash. Were they just ash fragments? Reflections Revered of ash. spirit ash. That, Revered yeah. spirit ash. That's right. And that would boost your summons, your spirit ash summons, or you know your mimic tier, whatever you're using, if you choose to use those things. And so you're rewarded for exploration by finding those, and that is what makes you stronger. What did you guys think of this progression system? Uh, I thought this was pretty interesting because not only do they want to like level out the end game builds that people have, the way the the leveling system works mechanically, like everyone's at like the the hard caps for the levels anyway. So even mm, if true, they were yeah, like a good point. in the DLC, they're like, oh, you you're gonna level up sixty times, but like you're at the caps, so you're not gonna gain that many stats. I, I leveled up my character thirty five times in the DLC anyway. And it, it yeah. didn't really make that big of a difference. I was just doing it to do it at that point. Uh, maybe boost my HP some more because it's it's tough. But uh, so for, from both of those perspectives, uh, I think they like set up a problem for themselves. They want to create progression. It would feel bad if you didn't get more powerful over 45 hours of gameplay. This is something that I like. I didn't love about Baldur's Gate 3 and I understood it in that game too but I played like the last 40 hours of that game at max level uh, so I think it's like a pretty good solution um, and I say it's pretty good because I recognize how for some play styles some people would not like this that they would be forced to go explore uh, for me I'm here to explore I'm not yep. here to fight bosses so this is perfect for me like this I, I thought that the base game of Elden Ring didn't always give you great rewards for exploring. Like you would get a spirit ash that you might never use or an item that doesn't fit your build. The best things you could find were the things that let you heal more often or make your flasks better. Yeah. And then in the DLC here, they give you these uh, shadow tree fragments or the, uh, the spirit ashes. And those are like the ultimate exploration rewards. So like for me personally and my play style, this is like this is an amazing solution to the problem that they built for themselves. Yeah, one and I'll one hundred percent agree. I think if you are just trying to play as like I want to go hit the bosses or whatever, I can definitely understand how it could be frustrating. But if you are wanting, it's it's almost as though they were trying to be like, hey. We want you guys to explore this world that we spent a few years crafting, you know, so yeah. would you would you please go do that? And I also play very exploration heavy. And so, you know, I'm uh, like I talked earlier about that, like river or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I probably spent 45 minutes riding up and down that river in the first zone jumping to my death multiple times trying to figure out like how <laughs> how do I like I know there's got to be a way that looks like I could maybe land there if I'm careful or whatever and so that's how I'm playing these games and so eventually when you get 
to the river and you're like, oh, this is awesome. Like it's that river and you you kind of go down it and at the end of the river, you find a waterfall and it's got one of these shadow tree fragments that makes you more powerful. It's like awesome. I knew there was going to be something important here, you know? And so like 100 percent, I I liked like there definitely are some that are tied to progression because like they are behind yeah. boss doors and whatever. But for the most part, you can get a ton of them just by exploring the world before you even start trying to fight anything, you know? Yeah, I, I think that if you just follow the main critical path and take a few detours, you can get up to Shadow Tree level like 13 or 14, which is pretty high. Uh, I finished it at level 17 um, in the DLC. So even for the people who don't want to explore a lot, you can still get to a pretty decent level uh, like that. Um, and also, uh, you just reminded me of something when you said, like, they want you to go explore. It's just like the base game when you go fight Margit and Margit stomps you into the ground. And that's from software telling you, hey, go check out Limgrave in the Weeping Peninsula. Go look at all that stuff. Come back later. Uh, this is the same thing because a lot of people will go into that first dungeon and they'll fight the the lion boss and they'll get destroyed. And that's the that's the cue. Like they're just trying to reinforce this because it's been so long since they first taught you that lesson, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know too, like a lot of people were a bit frustrated because it they were like, oh, this is so hard. And it's like, well, yeah, like the last, like most people didn't pick Elden Ring back up and play through it again to then get here. You know, like it, a lot of people bought the DLC and hopped straight into the DLC after not having played Elden Ring for a couple of years. And so it's like, yeah, you learned a lot of bad habits from like <laughs> being a max level character and just kind of, you know, like I, the first character I loaded in with was my main game character who was like on new game plus three or something like that was a Dex int build and like basically could get away with a lot because I had leveled up or uh, maxed out a bunch of things and, you know, was able to use all of these weapons. And then all of a sudden you, you run into like the first enemy in the DLC and you get your, your butt kicked because it's like, Oh, this is not doing nearly as much damage as I am used to doing. And I've learned <laughs> some bad habits because I would just kill everything before it killed me in, in the, you know, at the level that I was at out in the base game. But then you get to you get to here and you actually have to start learning almost to dodge and, and block and, you know, all of that kind of stuff again. Yeah, you've run into that knight with a machine gun crossbow and you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And well, and so I, I liked that they were basically like this was a way that they were like, hey, st like, go play the game. You, like, you're definitely not required to pick any up. I'm sure there's somebody who's already beaten the game without picking up a, a single shadow tree fragment or whatever. Oh yeah. There's like no hit like yeah. naked runs and stuff already. Yeah. But you know, I, I think it's, it's a good way of for them to kind of be like, Hey, that we, we put these things out in the world, go explore, but also you're going to spend, you know, five or six hours exploring, get a feel for the game again, learn how to dodge, learn how to block, like kind of like, Hey, go, go remember how to play this game. Uh, and then come back to machine gun Nightman, Uh, and, and then deal with that, you know? Yeah. On the flip side of that, how did you guys feel about the rest of the exploration rewards in the DLC? Because that was one of the complaints that I heard people bringing up against uh, the Shadow of the Earth Tree. And it was one that I kind of, by the end of it, I, I could definitely see that argument of I explore, I run around, I go through this thing or I get to this high place, there's a chest or there's an item and it's like a smithing stone seven. <laughs> yeah, this, I, I don't know, th this might sound pretentious, but like for me personally, the act of getting to the end of that catacomb or the act of figuring out how to get onto that dangerous ledge or something like that, that's the reward. The reward is that I got to the end. Uh, so if I pick up a smithing stone, by the way, you're picking up a ton of weapons. So I'm glad that they give you lots of smithing stones yep. uh, in the DLC. Uh, so picking up a new weapon or like 
So I played as a Dex intelligence character, and most of the weapons you pick up are not Dex intelligence weapons. So I do get that like, oh, cool, another straight uh, strength faith weapon. I haven't picked right. up any of those recently. I do get that a little bit, but most of the time I'm just happy to be there and be seeing new stuff. And, you know, if I fought a boss and I get their weapon and it doesn't fit my build, I still, you know, got through that boss and now I can go to a new area because I played it for 45 hours and I, I only spent a couple hours of that doing like the end game boss stuff. The rest of it was all just exploring, going through dungeons. So I, I don't know, like there's from rewards like your intrinsic uh motivation to explore by just giving you cool stuff to see and cool places to go and then every now and then you'll get a shadow tree fragment or a new spirit ash to try out uh, and i did try out a bunch of the new spirit ashes i tried out a few new weapons so like i get the complaint it doesn't feel great to pick up a smithing stone 7 at the end of a catacomb or something but I don't know. It just personally doesn't bother me that much. Yeah, I I wasn't overly bothered by that either. Like I can definitely understand people who like wanted something a bit more. At the same time, I'm kind of like, well, just because like you were following a extra life build guide and like already had the thing maxed out that you found all of these <laughs> like smithing stones pointless, like it doesn't mean that everybody finds them pointless. It's just like you but at the same time, there was one zone uh, in the DLC, the the one that was uh, a lot more frenzy and like sort of Bloodborne inspired that I was a bit disappointed in the like the exploration pieces of it just because it in that one particularly for me, it found like it felt like I was exploring around and finding my way onto some of these cool things. And there just wasn't anything there. It felt very empty to me personally. But also, I think that I was probably like going through that zone. Like, I think FromSoft wanted me to go through that zone in a, in a specific way. And I was like, no, I want to like spend five minutes hopping trying to like get up this tree root so that i can get up to mm -hmm. this other thing and i don't know <laughs> that i was supposed to be doing that i think it, i think they wanted me to progress through like that that zone in particular felt like a very linear zone that they wanted me to experience in a certain way but it was outside and so i was trying to play it like every other outside zone and they took the horse away which should have been the indication that that was not how they wanted me to play it yeah but damn it I'm going to play how I want to. <laughs> so, no, nah, but that, that, that was the only zone where I was like, eh, the rewards don't feel like they're hitting the same way because I'm, I'm not finding as many where I think like most of the time I'd get somewhere and there'd be an item there, uh, in every other zone. And even if it wasn't an item that I was like over the moon about, it was like, oh, there's a, you know, I pick up a little thing. I get that little hit of dopamine for my, you know, smithing stone seven and I move on. And I'm like, that's cool. Uh, that that one zone was the only zone where I was like, I'm not fine. Like, I, I don't feel like you've sprinkled enough little trinkets around. <laughs> so, yeah, the I, I agree with both of you as far as like for me, because the world is so diverse and, and interesting that just exploring it was kind of enough. Did kind of feel like they had at the core of the map, you know, you have like the main castle and everything was where the level design that Dave mentioned at the beginning of kind of like touching back on the like old school Dark Souls like that. It felt like it was there like you could enter that castle and exit it from like three or four different ways. And that was really cool. It felt like the further out you got on the map, the more kind of linear or. There were a couple like you you were talking about the that zone in the south and then there's like the dragon area and the dragon area is like extremely linear. There were a couple of spots where it was just like you weren't rewarded as much for exploration. I thought that the zones were like divert and uh, one of the zones that I like saw people complaining about online was the one with like the red flowers and the blue flowers and they're just not really being that much in those areas worth like looking for but i thought just like aesthetically it was yeah. just cool to be there and then also when you go completely far to the south like you find 
an area that's like just super incredible <laughs> and kind of say, that like oh wow moment <laughs> yeah yeah it in that area like yeah maybe you don't find a bunch of treasure but you find entire secret dungeons that's your yeah. exploration reward yeah. is uh is something better than finding a new sword is new levels and that's like to for me personally one of the purest joys in gaming is a new from software level to explore And if that is my reward, I can't think of anything I'd rather have as a reward. Yeah. Yeah, no, that for sure. I agree. We also, speaking of like exploration, mentioned the kind of multi-layer approach they took to this map. How, how did you guys find that? Did you like exploring this kind of multi-level? Like it felt to me where, like I said earlier, I could see the thing. And then there was either like some roundabout, like I just had to be patient and there was some roundabout way I was going to get there. Or I had to find like the specific path that they had built that would either get me up or get me down to where that was supposed to be. And a lot of times that was, you had to just kind of feel around the world. You couldn't really rely on the map because the map was very flat and didn't necessarily uh, translate the like dimensional world that you were in. So did you guys find that fun and interesting or was it a little bit more frustrating than exploring the base game? I mean, I I thought it was cool. I liked it. Like, I I, I just enjoyed seeing the map, like, take shape. I do wish that maybe there had been similar to, like, in the the base game, there's kind of, like, two or or three levels that you can kind of, like, swap between um, in the world. I do kind of wish there had been at least, like, uh you know an o- up above ground and like a belo- like a a sub level like to, it, yeah or like I, in like the zelda of, maps where you could pick yeah. a level in the dungeon to like see yeah like when i think about it i think of kind of like two main levels that there were uh to the the map and i do kind of wish that there had been like like you could cycle between them. I could them cycle between the them just because, especially in like that blue and red flower zone, the blue flower zone is kind of like stacked. I think it's the blue flower zone that's stacked under the red flower zone. And I and I was trying to like find my way around in like, and I kept swapping over to the map and being like, I have no idea where I am. I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the red flower zone above it. Uh, I can't swap down below that to see like where everything else is. Um, so. Uh, but that's like a small subjective nitpick on my end, because I mean, honestly, most from software games p- prior to Elden Ring didn't really have much of a map. Uh, and you just yeah, had to you just had to kind of like <laughs> learn where you were and memorize it. So like as someone who has played a lot of from software games, I, the map is just like a cool little feature to me. It's not a necessity because I'm used to playing without one so to be fair though it's a much bigger and yeah like broader world in elden ring than previous for sure from soft games where you're going from like level to i think sekiro technically had a map but it was basically just like pictures of the world it was completely <laughs> useless yeah. for navigation so yeah 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 I, I i think that the map is kind of an extension and like the map i mean how it gives you some information but not enough Uh, i think that that's an extension of the way the world is designed and they i think they really wanted you to get that feeling of this place is really close like as the bird flies but i don't know how to get there Uh, and i i really want to find out how to get there and like that process of finding that that's that's your reward for exploring is you know I poked around in a corner, I found a catacomb, and at the bottom of the catacomb, I came out in that place I couldn't find before. Yeah. So had the map given you all of that information, I think that you would have had less of those really cool moments of discovery. And so personally, I thought the map was like, at first, it seemed like it didn't give you enough information, but then you kind of learn how to read it and you're like, well, this zone, this on the map, this zone is green, and that's not where I am right now. It's really close to me, so green must be the layer below where I am. So now, when I look at the map and I see a little bit of green poking out under this like bridge or whatever, 
I know that's below me also. And I, I can kind of visualize how this connects. And it all kind of came together with the final area that I found, which is completely optional, like 20% of the total area of the map is 100% optional and extremely yeah. missable if you don't uh, if you don't read the messages people write on the ground, we'll yep. say. I was like going around like beating my head up against that. Like, how do I get down there? And then when I finally found it, you get that moment. And had the map given me much more clear information or had I been able to like, you know, switch levels, like you said, like in a Zelda dungeon and be like, oh, yes, it very obviously connects to this place up here. You like you can infer that from the way the map is already. Yeah. Had they given you more information, that feeling of exploration and discovery, I think, would have been lessened. Uh, so, I mean, they they did hide that area behind a pretty obscure thing. We'll yeah. say, <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> like, like the Dark Souls um, three, <laughs> yeah, like dragon area, which is which is cool. I I do respect that as a as a creator. The yep. The knowledge that uh, a lot of people are going to play this and they're they're not going to go to this place that you you built out and these cool things that they you built and this crazy boss fight at the end of this area they're not going to see it uh, they're going to miss this and they're okay with that obviously and I think that's cool but yeah the map giving you like fifty five percent of the information that you need I think is overall good for how they want you to play and the type of discoveries that they want you to make. Yeah. Yeah. Shifting out of world design a little bit. Uh, we mentioned this game kind of uh, giving us nostalgic feelings of early dark souls. I felt that as well in some of the music, there were a few boss tracks that, very much gave me I, don't, I think it was like the types of drums or like horns they were using or something that just kind of had that like you hear an old school dark souls one boss track and it just has like a certain element to it and i i was getting little bits and pieces of that in a few boss tracks and even outside of just the the kind of throwback sounding music that i heard the rest of the music was still i think on par with the bass game quality stuff i didn't i have nostalgia now for like limgrave's music as you're exploring and um a few of the other areas that you know you just you heard that music so much poking around the base game back when we were all extremely high and elden ring had finally come out um i don't know that any of the zone like kind of exploring ambiance music really connected with me like that did in the dlc but some of the boss tracks were really good what did you guys think about the music i liked it a lot like i the more i play i don't know how to really phrase this so i'll just get to the point i don't love the dark souls one soundtrack uh anymore it, it doesn't do a lot for me anymore other than the the songs that you could guess would still hit they still right. do for sure uh, but a lot of the boss tracks in Dark Souls 1 sound exactly the same uh, to me. Yes. And I think that the Elden Ring soundtrack, it's a different composer, so it makes sense. But there's a lot more variety uh, now with, and back several games as well also. But uh, I love the variety in the boss tracks. They're not all these super intense in-your-face, you know, chants and drums and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of melody. There's uh, some tying of like big moments in the soundtrack to big moments in the boss fight. Yeah. With one, maybe we can talk about it in the spoiler section, but there was yeah. one moment when a boss did something and the music went nuts. And I like, I was like, what? This is crazy. This reminds me of Ludwig <laughs> in Bloodborne. Yes. Like yeah. stuff like that. Uh, so that was great. I like the ambiance uh, music a lot too. Uh, the one that like sticks out for me the most is just the one when you're in catacombs, just have like those cellos going like really low creaky strings uh, that just, they fit perfectly with those, uh, just those, you know, those dingy caves and catacombs. But 
there are a lot of tracks uh, in this soundtrack that like I, I really noticed when I was playing. And it's kind of hard to focus on music in this game, especially yes. in boss mm-hmm. fights. Uh, but I I notice like, hey, the music's going nuts right now, and I love what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. I think the one that that jumped out to me as being like a good blend of the classic and the modern was the mesmer boss fight music, mm-hmm. and I'll probably use that for the the spoiler break so that you, the listeners, can hear it as well, at least a piece of it. But yeah, like you said, when you're able to take notice of the music while you're in this the hardest fight of your life then (laughs) it it must be doing something right yeah or you've just died enough that you (laughs) you can actually be like okay i've heard this is the music now because i have this part of the fight down yeah that only really happened to me for one boss and we'll get into that (laughs) in the the spoiler section yeah but no i i did i did like the music a lot it's i want to like sit down and actually listen to some of the boss tracks again uh without yeah. having to like be summoned into co-op uh a, a right. boss to hear it again cuz there were a few bosses that I I got in you know just within a few attempts that I feel like I had cool music but I didn't get a chance to like really process it enough because I was just hanging on for dear life <laughs> trying not to die you know so uh, there there definitely are a lot of tracks that I want to go back and listen to again too I don't know that there was anything like I'm a huge fan of just the like Elden Ring theme that plays at the main menu and then gets rehashed at like the final boss. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't know that there was anything that gave me that same level of like, oh, this is awesome. But like, there was definitely a lot of stuff that came very close. So. Yeah, that's I, just I, a good use of. Yeah. Like you hear this song every time you boot up the game because you're forced to boot it up every time because they make you quit out. You don't get to just like leave it suspended <laughs> or whatever. And uh and then they're like, Hey, you remember that track you've like heard the first fifteen seconds of a thousand yeah. times? We're yeah. gonna bring that back and make it even more epic. Yeah, and and like I think it, that track is so good for me that it would be hard to beat anyway. Like that's not a Saying, like, I don't know that there was anything that gave me that same, like, you know, goosebumps level of stuff is not saying that the music was bad or or talking down. It's just to me, that's like a masterpiece. And so it's just like it, it's really hard to beat that. Well, uh, I have kind of a a final question in the spoiler free section to kind of shift gears a little bit. But is there anything else that either of you wants to mention or or make sure we cover? before we go that uh take that question on and then move into spoilers uh just like i know we're we're gonna do verdicts at the end but i i think this is is good because we like we touched on this but i i we touched on like half of why i think the dlc is so good and like not to not that i need to save it until the verdict section to say that i think that this dlc is amazingly good right and it's it's because in my opinion, there are like there are a couple of things that From Software does better than anybody else, uh, and it's it's not difficulty really. That's that's not what I, I I mean. I think that they 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 walk that line really well in a lot of cases, and sometimes not, which we'll talk about in the, <laughs> the spoiler section. But um, I, I think that like they are best in class at making dungeons. Uh, designing worlds that are interesting to be in enemy designs like making cool enemies to come across and you're like what is that thing and then you go fight that and then you know visual design for bosses too i think they're really good at uh art like making their games look interesting um and this dlc is like a plus on every single one of those counts there are things that are not great about it but like since we're about to hop into spoilers like i just want to like emphasize that i think this is from software doing what they do best at a level maybe better than anything they've done before which is why the dlc hits so well uh for me personally and uh i i will talk about story in the spoiler section but i i do think the story is easier to follow in the dlc here than it was in the base game so I end up quite enjoying the story content in the DLC. Yeah, it, it, 
like you said, we'll get more into it, but it was definitely they did some things that made it a lot easier to follow uh, as yeah. well. So, yeah, I guess the last thing I would throw out there too is they added some new weapon types and some mm. new what obviously spoilers, like, <laughs> <laughs> new gear and stuff. No, I mean that was in the yeah in the promotional trailers. stuff. Yeah, but the one thing I did kind of notice about that is that it seemed like they added like one or two weapons per weapon type like they didn't add a new type and then kind of fill it out necessarily like i think i only found the one uh like light great sword or or whatever they called it and i I found like a couple great katanas so it's like they added i think like f- was it five or seven new weapon types something and then like, like one or two weapons per type it felt like but the ones that i played with I thought were really cool. I ended up sticking with the one uh, Milady, it was called, and I rocked that with its weapon art, and that carried me through the whole game, and I was pretty unstoppable with it until <laughs> the very end. <laughs> until you met the, the brick wall. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I do think it was not in a bad way, but it was like... It was disappointing in that I wanted more because they were fun and I wanted to keep trying out new things, not in a like, oh, I'm disappointed they didn't put more in because I totally understand. I mean, they added like a 130 something weapons all all said and done. Right. But I it when you look at it and like you look at your inventory and you're like, OK, well, I have like 15 different straight swords but i only have like two of this cool new weapon type that i'm enjoying uh it is kind of like man i wish there were more but also i look at that too as like i can't wait to see you know what they do next in a game like this because they'll probably be filling that out you know like it'll be like i don't think they're gonna just be like oh well the light great sword, you know, we're just not going to make it those ever again. You know, like I, I would expect that that becomes like a standard in. I don't know if they're going to make Elden Ring too, but like, uh, if they made yeah. something like this, I would imagine that could be a weapon type. You know, well, FromSofts are masters at iteration, so this is probably them like testing out some new ideas, and then yeah, we'll see them carried forward in whatever their follow up is, which is kind of where I want to end the spoiler free section. Where do you think that they go next? We know that Armored Core is back. Armored Core did really well. Uh, I'm pretty sure they said that this is the end of Elden Ring content. I don't know that they've ruled out completely. I don't know if that means they're not doing sequels or anything, or if they just mean that like Elden Ring, the base, like the game as it is now, this expansion is all they're doing for it. Do you, I mean, do you think we see a Dark Souls 4? Do you think we see Demon Souls and Bloodborne are tricky because they're tied to Sony? So, like, what, where do you guys think that they go from here? I mean, I feel pretty confident that they are going to make within, you know, it may not be their next game, but it'll definitely be within two or three games. I, I feel confident in saying they will make another dark fantasy. (laughs) <laughs> type of swords and sorcery game uh like I, <laughs> will it be elden ring 2 i don't know but i i do think if you enjoyed elden ring you will get something that basically is the spiritual successor to elden ring within the next couple of games that from software re- like they may do another armored core or you know something else in between um while they're spinning up and working on it but like, I, I don't think they're just stopping, but is this, I, I guess I don't know where the story would continue to go, Yeah. but also, you know, I probably would have said that after Dark Souls 1 or Dark Souls 2, like, I don't know where they're going to go with this. And then they came out with Dark Souls 3, tied it all together. So, you know, a, a lot of their stuff, even like parts of a series like Dark Souls kind of felt like its own sort of individual thing that only had sort of tangential ties to the previous game, at least until Dark Souls 3 released like a a DLC tying it all together. So, you know, that's maybe not a hot take that they're going to return to the dark fantasy well, but 
I think it'd be cool if they made like a Berserk game, but you know, just straight up, <laughs> just, just like just straight <laughs> up, like hey Miyazaki, like here you go, that thing that you've been like heavily inspired by, just make that a game. Uh, so, yeah, I I think that From Software is in our like. I, they're probably in as good a position in the industry as anybody is. Like Elden Ring was a huge breakout hit and like Armored Core did well. So I would assume there's going to be another Armored Core game. Uh, I would assume that From Software has the cachet where if they said like, hey, Sony, we want to do something with the Bloodborne IP, Sony would be like, yes, please. Like back that yeah. money truck up. <laughs> like we're on board. because. I I think that I I think that from software like they just they have the cachet now mm -hmm. where basically whatever they want to do yeah I think they can like they can green light you know Miyazaki had a quote recently talking about how Elden Ring was close but not exactly the type of RPG that he wants to make so like whatever that is now's <laughs> the time like that he yeah. has they have all the goodwill in the world to uh to follow creative passions and as long as it's you know a challenging dark fantasy sword and sorcery game it's going to sell yeah. based on Elden Ring's success i think it'd be really funny if they made like a turn based rpg uh, cuz <laughs> miyazaki talked about liking those as well so i'd be all up for that i want to see how from software translates their idea of challenge into turn based combat uh, cuz like that's a genre that I love, but it can get a little tired from time to time. So yeah, I, I would honestly like, so they, they have multiple teams now they're big enough where they make multiple games at the same time. So I don't think the next thing that comes out will be armored core. I think it'll be a standalone thing mm -hmm. like yeah. a bloodborne or Sekiro. And it will probably be different enough that like, it's going to be something that we didn't predict. I think, you know, kind of like Sekiro was like, Hey, this is familiar, but it's also very different. So that's my yeah, guess. That makes sense. Not an open world game. I think they want to get something smaller out there. That would, that would be my guess. Yeah. I would the return be... of Kingsfield, right? Dude. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that'd be the ultimate heat check where they're like, we're bringing Kingsfield and shadow tower <laughs> back. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Cause like, like you said, there are multiple teams and, you know, whatever they come out with next, I wouldn't be shocked if it's, you know, 2026 before it comes out. And so when's the next time that we see something from like in the style of like the dark fantasy challenging sword and sorcery thing, we we could still be a good four to six years out from from that coming out, which is yeah. a little bit of a bummer because <laughs> I want it now. Uh, but it's right. also like I'm excited to see, you know, like they'll two years from now, they'll drip feed like a, a little cinematic trailer and everybody will be hyped for another four years and then it'll win game of the year probably. So, you know. And I can't wait. Yep. We have a, a lot to look forward to. I, I agree, Dave, that FromSoft is, yeah, they're in the perfect position now. And I mean, took them a while. Their Their strategy of just like, have a vision and iterate on it slowly it it finally super paid off for them i'm happy for them it's it's exciting uh, i know that there's we're starting to see a bit of a turn of people complaining about there being too many souls likes but i don't know that 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 will happen with from's games specifically i feel like they can keep doing their thing and the fans are going to be there for it so excited to see what they do in the future yeah, they've never had as many fans as they do right now. No. So. And as the internet will remind us, uh souls like games uh can't come from some FromSoft because FromSoft makes actual souls games. Uh, oh yeah, so. right. right. <laughs> very very different. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Yes. So uh you got to get it in there before the internet does. <laughs> Let's uh, we'll take a quick break, listen to some music from the game. And when we come back, it will be full spoilers for Shadow of the Earth Tree.
right. We are in the spoilers section now. We can just we can say whatever we want to say. So, uh, Dave, as our guest, where would you like to start? Uh, do you, you want to just like give some favorite bosses, and uh, it's a good way to break the ice on spoilers. Yes, that's that's a. I loved the Bloodborne bosses. They had uh, the wait Bloodborne finger. bosses. Oh yeah, they okay. had the finger, the like too. the okay. finger mother underground. That I thought reminded I missed me. something for a second. <laughs> It reminded me of um, Ibritus. Mm-hmm. It had like that kind of vibe to it with a little bit of ROM in there with like the way that it would like shoot its lasers and stuff yeah. like that. So I thought that was very like Eldritch inspired. And then I also got kind of bloodborne vibes from the like frenzied God bosses, a, a little bit different, but still that sort of like, oh, I've walked in on this like cosmic God that <laughs> I probably shouldn't even be looking at because... <laughs> You know, if if they if they actually were true to the way that Frenzy behaves in the game, that that boss would just like nuke you instantly for being in the room with it. You would just have instant Frenzy meter. Mm -hmm. And like the cutscene when it's you like beat up on the little grunt and it's like, wow, this is kind of it's kind of ridiculous. And then the cutscene triggers. And I thought it was crazy. You had to do that every time you attempted the boss. (laughs) You had to do the like little beat up on the guy and then the cutscene started and then he like rips his own head off with that crazy sword that like wraps its tendrils back upon itself and is like yeah this is this is disturbing it's awesome it's classic from soft i i really liked those two i mean there's probably good things i could say about most bosses but uh, i'll let one of you two (laughs) take it from there i i think along the lines of uh like talking about midra one of the cool things, and again, I think this is like partly related to just being on next gen uh, hardware, at least on consoles. Uh, yeah, the bosses have never been as visually spectacular, and uh, some would say visually busy in places yeah. <laughs> as they are in this. Uh, and that Midra fight is one of them. Like the whole place is on fire. There's it's like a volcano shooting that uh, madness fire all over the place. Uh, the dancing lion was like that too. Like the visual spectacle of that fight was incredible. And that's the one where it leaps up in the air to do the elemental magic attacks. And that's when the music, like the choir hits and you're like, it like Whoa. Crash. yeah, that was crazy. Uh, and then by the way, did you guys fight the second one in yeah. the, the ruins when it jumps up and you're like, okay, bring on your lightning attack, Bozo, and it shoots basilisks out at you. Yeah. And then you're like <laughs> trying to dodge all the death blight that's just sitting on the ground. And it's like, yeah. yep, yep. I, I died to that once and I was like, oh, so this is how it's going to be from soft. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I said this, uh, I put this on Twitter. Uh, we were talking about it in my server, but like. From Software doesn't get enough credit for being funny and having like a really good sense of comedic timing. And their their idea of comedy is really messed up and bleak and uh, it'll probably kill you. That moment is a perfect example of that where you're like, okay, this boss, I remember this boss. I fought it 20 times. I'm ready. No, you're not. It's shooting basilisks out at you. The scariest enemy from Dark Souls 1 is yeah. back. And... <laughs> Just with the the timing of that, it made me laugh, like legitimately laughed out loud when those popped out. Like, oh, come on. Yep. Yep. And and I forget if it was R- Rilana or the final boss. I think there's a cutscene for both of those. But like, if you die the first time, the second time, they just insta charge you. Uh, and, yeah. and if you're not prepared for it, it's just like, I, I know I just died uh, to each of them. And I was like, that's that's pretty hilarious it's it's like when you fight Renala in the base game and like the first move that she does is like the death star laser at you and almost (laughs) almost universally every clip that i've seen of somebody getting to that part of the fight is just them instantly getting vaporized by it so (laughs) those are those are very good moments there's a couple of always also does that to you Mm. commander gaius yeah favorite boss dylan that guy is a dick yeah (laughs) Yeah, I was not <laughs> was not a huge fan of that guy. So so one of the things, no, we're talking about bosses. One of the things that I do I just don't like about Elden Ring and Dark Souls 3 and now this DLC 
is that from software's philosophy in designing boss fights has just been to increase aggressiveness, decrease yep. windows to punish when you dodge attacks. Mm, like yep. the final boss is like this, Mesmer's yep. like this, Gaius is like this. It's like you you dodge like their five hit flurry, and then you have time to hit them one or maybe two times or heal one time, and then it's back to dodging another flurry of attacks. Like yeah. I don't I don't like I don't think that that's interesting. And I don't hate all the fights that are like this. Like, I actually really like the Mesmer fight. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, same. But the trend is not great, in my opinion. And then, like, the final boss is just, like, emblematic of this. It, like, it reminds, especially Phase 2, reminded me of Gale at the end of Dark Souls 3. Yeah. (laughs) With, like, the delayed... uh, you know, he swings and then there's another delayed hitbox following or something like that. But it's just like, it's so relentless that it's just like, I don't know, I I wish they would just like come up with some gimmicks again for boss fights or, yeah. you know, have a, have a boss that's like, that hits really, really hard, but like can only swing a couple times at once or, you know, like instead of just these infinite stamina infinite combo mad you know dudes with swords visually story-wise i still think they're really interesting music's great and everything like that but uh that that trend in like designing how the boss actually works is is i think has worn out its welcome officially that was probably my biggest negative on shadow of the Erd tree and it really didn't like fully tip me over and like potentially affect my verdict until the final boss until <laughs> and we're in the spoiler section until Radon. Yeah. I but it's something that like you said, I for Dark Souls month this year, like I went back to Dark Souls and Dark Souls 3 playing um against the Nameless King and then you have um Elden Ring base game, they did this Lies of P took this uh approach to heart where every boss has like a weird wind up to its attack so mm-hmm. like you can't really find a good rhythm everything has like there were bosses that uh, there was one boss in Liza P that had like what was it Dylan like, like a 14 swing combo or something yeah <laughs> the, and like it's the just final like, boss yeah well it was the like electricity lady what? oh i beat her in two tries so i didn't see a whole lot of her moves hey there we go <laughs> yeah i i beat guys on my first attempt but that's okay, okay. I am, i'm aware i still can't <laughs> beat shadows of yarnum so <laughs> but it's yeah i agree dave and it was something that i i started to feel the further i got into this dlc that and some of the enemies too like the um the mesmer knights for example there were just certain things that kind of you mentioned from soft being able to walk that line between like difficulty and you know it feeling fair and like just being able to balance the difficulty and still have the game be fun and i felt like there were some instances where they they tipped over that line and and like you said it seems to be a trend and i i also don't love that being the trend of just these hyper aggressive hyper combo bosses i i 100 percent agree that i would much i think if they want things if they if they feel the need to keep increasing the difficulty they need to find some fresh ways to do that because they can't really keep going this direction much more and it being playable even like the i mean yeah well so, and go ahead i was gonna say i i think they found themselves kind of caught in that that arms race too where it's it's you know like especially now like back in the day there were obviously like guides but it was like a fa- a game facts guide for dark souls one that was like had ascii art in it versus like now where every major video game publication is coming out with like their guides and their builds and there's all these you know huge youtube channels with like here's uh you know another broken build uh where you can you know do half the boss's health in one hit and so i do feel like they're kind of caught and i think that's part of it is the amount of options that they're able to give because 
to me, who appreciates Sekiro, but also did not like Sekiro for exactly the reason you guys are talking about. However, I don't feel like Sekiro gets the same hate for a boss doing like a 45 hit combo, you having, you know, half a second to punish and then having to go back to like block a bunch. I know that Sekiro is fundamentally a different game, but like I was going to say in Sekiro with your parry, you're still essentially yeah. doing damage. So like you, yeah, you are you can tip the scales playing defense. Right. But to me, it feels like because they've offered so many different ways to play and different ways to build in Elden Ring, which is something I really love about it. They've also had to kind of like adjust some of the bosses to kind of combat some of those more cheat because like you know the build that i was using I, I was replaying the game before the dlc came out and the build i was using was like a bleed build that basically had zero defense and was just like trying to get in there and bleed everything super quick and the dlc to me felt very much like a response to that play style because pretty much almost every boss in the you know base game died pretty quick you know, within a couple of attempts to my build in the base game. But then you get to the DLC and you're just getting your ass kicked. And so I can understand why they did it. I I think my biggest problem is there's not necess- because there are so many different ways that you can go. There's not clear feedback of what do I need to be doing differently? Mm-hmm. Like the final boss. I was still playing a bleed build, but I had shifted kind of how i built it and for the final boss i had to shift again and like actually use a shield and it was still a bleed build because i was still using like a bleed spear and everything but it was it was kind of one of those things where it was like if you want me to play with a shield like if if you've designed this boss to need a shield it'd be super cool if you could give some sort of a feedback to me (laughs) to to help me understand that rather than just kind of being like, yeah, here you go. But, you know, that's that is from soft. You know, it is just kind of like a do it your way, figure it out. I don't know. I think that's kind of where I'm at is like because of the freedom to build how we want to. I think there are ways to play and beat every boss that work and decrease the challenge for every boss. But I do think that it's tough to it, like it felt like you needed to change your build way, or the the bosses in this DLC wanted you to shift up a lot more frequently than maybe like the base game wanted you to shift up or or kind of rethink how you're playing things. I don't know. It's it's one where I'm just kind of like, yeah, like I, I'm not a huge fan of the like 45 hit combo bosses in general. I'm not I don't mind the ones that take a while to wind up. I I do think that is kind of just like, oh, you just learn how that works. But like I said, I do think it's like sort of that arms race where it's like, okay, I don't know how they get around it without just like people being like, well, here's a build that destroys every boss in the game because now this boss is slow. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah, it, it I don't know. I think that Melania in the base game does a really is a really great boss for giving you feedback on like your strategy and you know like oh I'm I'm going to she just has a katana I'm going to block it. Well, it's healing her the whole time so blocking is probably not a great thing to do in this uh so I I kind of agree that like if you're trying out different tools you know maybe like I'll pull out a shield or maybe I'll try some magic or something like the feedback on what you should be doing is not great. Um, and I, I don't necessarily agree. There's a lot of people saying like, you have to respect for the final boss. Uh, and I don't necessarily agree with that, but you do have to change the way you play for the final boss. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's others like this too. Uh, in my episode, uh, my guest Charlie made a great point that bosses now in, uh, in Elden Ring are so great at closing distance quickly that like I don't know how you would just play a pure caster character now because you can't stay far enough away from bosses to to cast spells like you you have to use like a tanky summon yeah. it's not you have to 
bring in a spirit ash or something that that would pull aggro is the only way I could think of. Yeah, and that's how I that's how I beat a bunch of bosses. I use the mimic tier and I use the new spirit ash, the Telu the Golem Smith or something like that. Yeah. So, uh did it was like super tanky and did crazy posture damage to a lot of uh a lot of bosses. But it, it seemed like it seemed like that that was kind of mandatory for a lot of bosses just to get them off of you for five seconds at a time to do anything uh, is you had to have someone there to draw that relentless aggro away from you. Um, since we talked about the final boss, I want to share my final boss story with you guys because it sounds yeah. like you guys both had a rough time with the final yes. boss. Uh, Radon's a dick. By the way, uh, I think it's funny just real quick that... I'm sure from software we're planning this story wise the whole time, but I think it's funny that Radon was the most controversial boss in the base game, other than Melania. And then they're like, "Guess who's the final boss in the DLC? <laughs> Radon's back, baby!" Yep. I thought that was great. In the final boss, I played it. I beat it on like my sixth or seventh try. Um, and here's how I did it. So uh, I I played it a couple times, got destroyed immediately. Um, it's one of those that like dive bombs you as soon as the fight starts. So you can't yep. summon your spirit ash right away. You have to wait yep. until later. Uh, so I got dive bombed and killed pretty quickly. And then I got to phase two a couple of times, just doing the whole, like, let my spirit ash tank. I will shoot magic or I'll run up behind him. Um, and I got pretty good at dodging the combos in phase one, but phase two is just a lot. So yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, let me summon a real person in here. And I like, I helped people fight Mesmer for hours because I like that fight a lot. And we, we beat Mesmer like 10% of the time because it's just, it's tough. People die, you lose your connection. I figured that would happen, but I would get to learn the, you know, the phase two moves and have a better chance of doing it with just my mimic tier like I did for every other boss. Right. I summoned a character in there uh, named Hero, and Hero <laughs> got hit one time in the entire fight. <laughs> nice. And so my contribution to the final boss was I stayed alive stayed so alive. that Hero yeah. could beat the final boss. <laughs> yes. And uh, it was pretty anticlimactic, not going to lie. But again, I'm not here for fighting yeah. the final boss 75 times. So at the end of the day, I was like, that's that's pretty sweet. So yeah. that's I, that's how I beat the Elden Beast too in the main game because I couldn't do it. I, I summoned in someone who basically soloed it with the double health and everything. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, that's that's how I beat the final boss. I get why everyone is like really mad at it. I I do think it's it's a lot. It is the final Elden Ring boss, so like it should be the hardest in my opinion. I just don't like the way that they made the difficulty. Uh, with, you know, he combos relentlessly, and then every combo ends in an AoE, and every swing of each combo has a trailing hitbox, just like Gale's Cape in Dark Souls 3. Like, I don't like that that's where the challenge came from, but it should be cha it should be a challenge. Yeah. And I don't know anyone who's, unless they're being stubborn, I don't know anyone who's like, yeah, I've been fighting the final boss for a week now, I can't beat it. Like, I don't, I haven't heard that, so... People are getting through it however you can, which is, that's how you got to do it. Yeah. Well, and, and like I said, I swapped my build to like a, a bleed, like spear build and just yeah. had like a big great shield. And so I was just sitting there like taking his combo <laughs> poke, hits poke, and just poke, poking poke. him uh, <laughs> and triggering the bleed and, you know, whatever. And, you know, getting better at like some of the stuff that was not blockable or, you know, whatever, getting better at dodging that kind of stuff. But I, I was very similar to you where I looked at that and I was like, I know that I could beat this with the build I had. Uh, I just don't have the patience to, to spend the amount of time to learn it. And like, I know it's possible because I've seen, you know, clips of people soul level one, no hitting the, the yeah. final boss. <laughs> so, so like, I know there the are people that can, yeah, that but one streamer did it on a dance pad. Yeah. And now, now she's doing it playing two Elden Rings at the same time. She's probably going to beat it like with a controller on one game and the dance pad on the other. So like, yeah. it is doable. But <laughs> for yeah, me, like, exactly. 
this I, I I feel a weight lifted off of myself here because I realized for me, just seeing the boss do its thing like a handful of times is enough. I don't care about the satisfaction of taking it down myself after fighting it all day. I don't need that. I'm I'm happy to just see what Radon looks like with yeah. Nicola in the final boss fight. That's all I needed. Yeah, and and it's, you know, it's one of those where I I still feel a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Even though I, I summon somebody <laughs> in. But at the same time it's like, yeah, like I I recognize that I just don't have the patience, you know? So yeah. and and like you said a, a big part of it is just like I got to phase 2. I saw what phase 2 looked like. That's that's kind of like what I needed, you know? Andrew. So <laughs> yeah, for me the thing that really frustrated me because I'm not so I'm not the souls purist like I was using my mimic tier I had yeah. I initially went in with my bloodhound fang like jump attack bleed build and got pretty far into that then I found milady and I put on the armor from that knight that had the machine gun crossbow at the beginning and I got a sick weapon art that would let me either do like a crazy flurry of slashes or like do this jump attack dive with the sword. And that jump attack dive was pretty broken because it could avoid a lot of incoming attacks and then it would close distance similar to like what the bosses can do to you. And so the thing that I've always said about Elden Ring specifically, you know, when we talk about the difficulty of From Games is that FromSoft gives you all these tools to combat that difficulty you have your spirit ashes you have your mimic tier specifically you have the ability to call in friends or strangers and the tools that i had that i was using i got through every single boss in the dlc with like handfuls of attempts each one i i first attempt like i beat gaius on my first attempt and i beat that scarlet rot centipede chick i can't remember her name ramana yeah i beat ramana on my first attempt and so using the tools that i had and the build that i had like i felt pretty capable yeah but i could not have beat radon with that build and with my uh mimic tier unless like you guys said i wanted to commit to that and maybe still be trying today yeah, because it just it it wasn't <laughs> happening. It, I wasn't doing the damage I needed to do. I didn't have the opportunities to hit. I couldn't get off my weapon art that I had been able to use for previous fights. Like, so I did the whole. I did the same thing Dylan did. I did the big shield and poke, just because I was like, I want to finish it. And it it kind of bummed me out because I had been able to overcome everything else with this build that I was enjoying playing up to this point. And the at the end, it just felt insurmountable. And like you said, Dave, this is the culmination. This is like the biggest, baddest boss. And I agree with that. And every FromSoft DLC final boss has been infamous, like the Orphan of Cost. People talk about how brutal that fight was. People talk about Gale. So they are sticking to their trend. And, I, and that's like the one thing I can kind of give them the benefit of the doubt on is like, this is supposed to be like the toughest of the tough for Elden Ring content. And so they did that. But I'm curious, like I'm hoping that this isn't kind of like the new norm or the new baseline going into whatever their next game is, is like, let's, let's take a step back from this a little bit. Let's get some, some different way. Like you were saying, Dave, some different ways to make these bosses challenging, not the same methods you've been using. And maybe let's have some bosses that just aren't that challenging. It's okay. Mm -hmm. to have some like gimmick fights or some that are more spectacle over challenge you know we can we can break it up a little bit so yeah that radon the radon fight just kind of like for that to be the note that like i left the the experience on was kind of a bummer mm -hmm. yeah yeah you talking about like wanting different experiences from the bosses got me thinking like, you, you want to know what the bosses that frustrated me the most were honestly the, like, the NPC-sized bosses in those yeah. mausoleums. Yeah. Uh, I hated every single one of those <laughs> because 
the arenas I was so I was playing Dex Intelligence again and I was like pretty split. I used a lot of magic spells. And so I would like to first of all you can't use spirit summons in those fights for some reason. It's a very oh, arbitrary yeah. decision. I mean, I beat them all, whatever, but those fights have that same design, the relentless comboing, but they like they're they're like you. They should follow the same rules. R- Radon yeah. doesn't need to follow the stamina system like I do. But right. me fighting, you know, just a, another NPC with a great sword, he shouldn't be able to swing that thing 19 times in a row because I can't do that. And it feels worse when like those characters uh, can do that. And honestly, it's like a it's another trend where, in my opinion, the worst enemies in from software games are like usually the invader enemies, the NPCs. They've been bad yeah. since Demon Souls. Like every single one of them has been terrible. Right. So I just like, you guys talk about your cheese build for the final boss. I had to cheese the fact that NPC invader enemies can't handle jump attacks. Like the AI just doesn't know what to do. So that's what I did in those fights. I just jump attack, roll out of the way, jump attack, roll out of the way. Uh, You know, a jump attack does 1 24th of their HP. So that's what I'm doing in there for like five straight minutes. Just jump attack, roll away uh, because they, you will not stop swinging that damn great sword. So yeah, I, I had to, had to complain about those. If we're talking about boss experiences that we didn't like, like I think I got lucky that I summoned in uh Mr. Hero or Ms. Hero in the final boss. But like those, those NPC fights, those were some of the worst ones for me. I hated them. Yeah, I I agree. I'll give a shout out to the uh, oh, what was it? The Shadow Tree Avatar. Oh, that, I was gonna say I never was hated maybe, a flower. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that that was, I love that fight. I loved it. I I I liked it when I thought it was two phases, and and then Dave, when it was a third <laughs> phase, I was like, you motherfucker. Like, I like that. <laughs> I liked how as the phases kept going. There's like storytelling in that fight. That's what I liked. As the phases yeah. kept going, it kept rising again with less HP, uh, less frequent attacks, but more powerful attacks. Like you can you can see the the thing drawing any strength that it has left, and it just keeps getting less and less each time it gets back up. I thought that was cool. Yeah. I beat that on like my second try. Wow. Um <laughs> also uh the the weapon art that you can get from that, or it's a spell maybe. Yeah. I saw some people using that in the Mesmer fight when I was like co-oping with people and that just shreds that, that thorns, uh, spell. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was yeah. like shredding Mesmer in that fight. Yeah. I went to the, I went to the sunflower too early and, uh, <laughs> I, I, I gave it everything I had. I was out of flasks. I killed it. Phase two, I was like, okay, I did it. <laughs> and then it stands back up and I'm like out of flask, out of everything. I was like, well, I'm not going to try this again. I'm going to go get some more Skidoo fragments, which <laughs> I know that, you know, it's come out there shadow fragments. But the whole time I was playing through the game, <laughs> every time I pick one up, it's like, oh, it's another Skidoo fragment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yep. So then when, when I leveled up some more and I came back to like a more appropriate level, I didn't have as much trouble with it. That that's another interesting thing Dylan and I discovered. Um yeah. Cuz we would co-op, we would like hop on and and co-op together and try to fight some things. There were multiple bosses and this was one of them where we could not beat it together. But then when we stopped playing cooperatively and we just fought it in our own worlds Mm -hmm. with with maybe a a summon yeah Yeah. we would beat it in like one try or two it was like the buff that they were like giving the bosses for having a a assistance was really in intense in the dlc yeah that's that's why i only summoned one person for the final boss and not two because i was like if radon has three times the hp we are never beating it yeah exactly And I feel like that could probably be tuned a little bit more. If anything, that would make just everything a whole lot more doable. Uh, if yeah. they just kind of tweaked 
some of that. I understand that they're not going to because they're from soft and they will die I mean, they on might, their hill, but they might tweak some percentages yeah. in a patch, but there were definitely bosses though, where it felt like someone put a decimal in the wrong place where they just <laughs> yeah. had so much more health. Uh, well, we were, yeah, we were doing such like you would, we'd be chipping away at like yeah. the sunflower was a good example. We'd just be chipping away. And then when I went and tried it solo, I would take like, you know, a quarter of the health with a good hit. And it was like that same exact attack I did before, but I'm taking like way more of this health bar in one swing. And so it was just. Yeah, like it wasn't just halved. It was like your damage was like quartered or eighthed, uh, it felt mm. like. And that so it just... became a real battle of attrition. Yeah. But um, let's see. What else do we want to talk about in the spoiler stuff there? We haven't really talked about story too much. Um, you're there's a reason that when you fight your there's a reason first of all that you're fighting radon that he's back and then mm-hmm. that why why he's giving mikola a piggyback ride uh i don't full fully like he's he's his consort so he would and he used like moog's body to bring yep. radon back so like a whole bunch of twisted weird yeah. from soft stuff's going on but like you said dave like you had a lot of you have specific like a specific cast of npcs that you're kind of keep i kept up with most of them pretty successfully throughout the the expansion which i can't say for the base game and then there are like light pillars of light in the world that are like hey story stuff over here maybe npcs over here and then you would get more of that you got dialogue um from npcs like during and after boss fights like i don't know if you summoned in the npc for mesmer that you summon him in like in the boss arena Mm. and he's like yelling at him through the whole fight or then there's like the the dragon rider guy who wants to kill bail that like yeah i got to listen to him scream bail like nine ten times (laughs) trying to fight that dragon so that it feels like they're finding Again, maybe a little bit more experimentation that they'll carry forward, but like they're trying to inject some of these moments in the dialogue and stuff in ways that it's like harder to miss. Yeah, I I thought that the storytelling was easier to follow because everything's focused on Mikola and you're following Mikola. Mm-hmm. Every NPC that you talk to at the grace points next to those crosses is talking about Mikola. You get to a certain point and Mikola's great rune breaks. That's a storytelling moment. You're like, oh, why did why did he break his great rune? Then after that, you talk to those NPCs and you notice they're different because they're not under his spell anymore. So like that focus makes it way easier to tell. And then you have all the other trademark from software storytelling stuff. Uh, you learn a lot about Merica and about Mesmer. Uh, like why that horn scent guy is in the boss arena to summon to fight against Mesmer. Like you learn the the history between the horn scent and Mesmer and Merica's history and the people in the jars in the jails. And all of that stuff is like the more traditional from software storytelling. Yeah. But like they wanted to tell a distinct story arc about a singular character probably the character that was the most mysterious from the base game. Yes. And the way that they did that by just having you follow in his footsteps and talk to people about him consistently throughout it. By the time you got to the end, if you were paying attention, and then if you read a couple item descriptions here and there, you had a pretty clear idea of who Mikola was, what Mikola wanted, how he wanted to go about doing it. And then at the end, you put a stop to it basically yeah. with uh with the the thing with Radon. Also the other thing I like real quick is that this DLC in a way that no other from software game to my knowledge has really ever done uh references things that you did in the base game. So like you killed Moog, so now Moog's mm-hmm. body is free to be used as yeah. a vessel for Radon. Um there's a couple other parts where they're like this character's dead and I know that it was you that did it. And so now something is a little bit different because of that. And I thought that was cool too. Yeah. 
Well, and and I think too, like you mentioned, uh, like oh, you killed Moog, and so now his body is to be used. I thought it was very cool and interesting that everything that is happening in this DLC is happening much more in real time uh, versus, yeah. you know, like almost every other from software game. It's talking about like ancient history that you're just kind of like finding out as you yeah. play versus this where it's like you enter the world by killing or the the uh, lands of shadow by killing Moog. Which means that, like, from the time you killed Moog to, like, and and like you said, Mikla's rune breaks while you're in there, which means Mikla is still, like, doing his little journey thing uh, mm -hmm. while you are in the Lands of Shadow sort of following him around. Um, it's not like he's, it, it, like, Merica in the base game where she's just kind of been, like, hanging out in the middle of the Erd Tree for however long, sort of, you know, indiscriminate time period, but also maybe thousands of years who knows mm -hmm. so I, I thought that was very cool and interesting where it was kind of like oh this is like stuff that isn't just like i'm an archaeologist uncovering things like there is some of that because like you do find out the mesmer stuff which did happen a lot longer ago it seems but like the the Mikola stuff is all happening pretty close to when you're experiencing it which you know was cool yeah and it, it helps having the context, however much you got or like have had the chance to learn in the window between base game and expansion, but having the context of the base game and like Mikola being that kind of missing piece to the lore and the story, it's like, okay, I know, I kind of understand the world and I understand where we're at and what we're doing, whereas if this had just been like, you know, you talk about this being a standalone thing. If the, if we didn't have the base game, the base game and we're just walking in there and they're like, we're following kindly Mikola. And we're like, who, why, yeah. what, what's <laughs> happening? So it does help to have like the context of like the greater world and storyline, you know, going into this and understanding who he is, his relation to the other characters. Like, Oh, he's using his brother to fight for him. Like, I understand that because I know that's his brother, you know, that makes more sense than just like, Oh, this guy with two big swords is here stopping me. So yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the story stuff for, from the, from the expansion. I, I really like the, like the setting and the tone and, and, lore of elden ring i think it might be my second favorite to bloodborne so yeah, like me too i don't know how much of that is george R. R. martin or if it's just you know miyazaki just doing his thing we'll never really know <laughs> unless yeah. we weren't there to see the how it all shook out but whatever they did i like it i like the the setting and the lore quite a bit there's also some really good backstory stuff that you learn that is just like classic from software stuff. Like you learn a little bit about the outer God that's like out, out in the distance. Uh, and you learn about the fingers uh, and like the fingers yeah. that are giving guidance to America and other characters. And in classic from software fashion, the fingers are receiving like transmissions from the outer God but that stopped a long time ago. That's what you learn. And so like the advice that they're giving is outdated at best. And so everybody who's taking that advice and then acting on it is acting on things that are not real, basically. It's which is like a, a very tragic and very from software thing to have happen in one of their stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I love the story with Merica and uh Mesmer and why Mesmer's in the land of shadow and why we didn't hear about him before. Like they explain that in a really interesting way, why the land of shadow, because it used to be part of the lands between why it's not part of it anymore, why it's hidden. All of that stuff is like, I don't want to say it's easier to find than the main game, but I just think that like the fact that the main game has so many main characters. Yeah that your attention gets spread out and like you pick up an item and it will probably relate to one of what, like 20 main characters. Whereas in the DLC, if you pick up an item that's telling a story, it's going to be about one of like six characters. 
Yeah. So it makes it a lot easier to, even if you just casually read item descriptions like me, it just made it easier to to start putting pieces together. And like, I, I got the joy of reading an item description about Merica in the shaman village and then being like, oh, I remember this other item description about Merica from before because it wasn't watered down with item descriptions about 19 other characters. Yeah. There's like five or six. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed learning about the story in here. And I agree with you, Andrew, like this DLC kind of like clicked a bunch of puzzle pieces together. Whereas like the base game, I just had like a broad understanding of like, I know who, I know who Godwin and Godfrey and Godric, and I know who they are and roughly how they relate to each other. That's about it. Right. Whereas the DLC, I get like deeper understanding about characters and it, it elevates like my enjoyment of the story to that level that I enjoy the Bloodborne story. And I enjoy the Bloodborne story more because of the theming of it is way cooler in my opinion. Yeah. uh, For what I like, but yeah, I I like this a lot, and it's the first time I'm like on a podcast since Bloodborne gushing about a From Software story because I think yeah. all this is super cool. Well, and I I liked too, like you said, it it filled in a lot of puzzle pieces uh, to kind of explain stuff, like explain like who Mikola is or whatever. But I also enjoyed sort of the subversions of like what the theories were, what the expectations were, because you know like. Moog is a great example where Moog was, you know, everything we knew about him from the base game was kind of like, oh, he's like kind of a creep who like kidnapped yeah. Mikola and, you know, wants to marry Mikola and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then you find out that like, well, actually, Mikola has like charming powers and like charmed Moog to do this because he wanted to use Moog's body to resurrect Radon. And, you know, it's like, oh, everything that we thought we knew about Moog was wrong. And like the, the new stuff that we're finding out has completely changed how maybe we view Moog similar to, uh, like you said, the, the stuff with the fingers where it was like, Oh, the, the fingers are not actually like the fingers are not actually interpreting the greater will or whatever. It's all, you know, everybody's like, Oh, Ronnie killed her fingers to become a god or whatever and it's like well no she kind of just found out that they were lying the whole time you know (laughs) and and so i don't know i I enjoyed that part of it too where it was kind of like it filled in a lot of pieces but it also was like you thought it was this way but it's actually this other way uh a lot of times too well is there anything else that we need to mention before we move into our verdicts what else do we need to cover about Shadow of the Erd Tree before we uh, exit spoilers. I thought it was cool how little of Shadow of the Erd Tree you actually had to engage with to get to the final boss. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought that was very... We, we talked about the exploration earlier. I thought that was a very neat way to reward exploration as well. Because realistically... All you had to do was fight the Golden Hippo, I think. You may yeah. not even have to fight that. Mesmer. Well, yeah, I guess you, you don't have to. to the side. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you have to fight what? Mesmer and. You have to fight Mesmer and the. Uh, the centipede. The, yeah. Mesmer, the centipede, and. The lion. The I lion. Think. Do yeah. you have to, no? I I actually I don't, I don't think, think you have so. to fight the lion. You can go yeah. around it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, like, it's I basically, think there's there's four bosses that are required. So it's 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 mesmer. It's the the why can I not remember the <laughs> centipede? What her name is, but it's yeah. her. And then it's Radon. That's three of them. What is the fourth? Is the fourth the like? npc invasion fight before radon do you have to do you have to fight uh relana can you go around relana you can you can definitely go around relana but i don't know uh because like there's there's a spirit spring that takes you up to the like yeah, shadow right. atlas yep i there's there's definitely something that like triggers the breaking of the 
of Mikolas Rune. It's when you go to the Shadow Keep area for the first time. Okay. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think, because, like, you don't have to fight Saint, or, uh, the putrid guy in St. Trina. You don't have to, like, do any of that. No. You don't. I. It might honestly just be Mesmer and Ramina and Radon. Uh, that might be it. Yeah. Which, like I said, I think is is kind of cool that that's really, yeah. like, all you have to do. Um, similar to, like, how there's so much in the base game of Elden Ring, but like, would you really break down like, well, what do you actually need to do to get to the final boss? It's really not all that much. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I just thought that was very cool that it is, it's only like three or four required fights and you can get around a lot of them. Now you're not going to want to, but you can't like for a subsequent playthrough, I think it'd be interesting to just kind of be like, I wonder how much of this I can ignore <laughs> and just kind of go straight to where I want to go and like, how, how can I explore my way around this and and do these things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that it's a testament to like how good it is that so little is required, but every, so like anyone who puts a decent amount of time into the game is going to go explore because everything is so fun to explore and go check out. And that, yeah, Kind of leads me into like the last thing that I wanted to uh, to talk about, which is I I think that the Shadow Keep is probably one of the best levels they've ever made. Yeah, so which good. is like I I don't know what their retention is like of employees, but like you always hear about how like Nintendo's had a bunch of the same people work there since the eighties, and so like they're like oh well, we're gonna try something new in a Zelda game or like we're gonna make a new Mario game. We have decades of knowledge and iteration on our like under our belts and from software has not been along that long but they have been making these games now for almost 15 years for 15 years since demon souls and so like i I think that those things that they're really good at they just keep getting better at because some of the dungeons in the base game like stormvale castle and the capital are like crazy good dungeons and then the shadow keep i think is the best one it's the most complicated it has the most entrances and exits of anything i think they've ever done the like the storage the specimen storage warehouse yeah. that is like an entire dlc from bloodborne almost like just yeah. that room with like it's it's levels and it's winding staircases and the you know you jumping on the bookcases and jumping on the hanging statues or the the beasts or whatever that are in there. And that's, you have to go in there to get to Mesmer, but you don't have to go through most of it. You don't have to find any of the exits out of it, except the one that takes you to the ruins. Yep. But there's like, there's that exit. There's the one that takes you to Gaius. There's the one that takes you to the shadow tree avatar. There's the one that takes you to the shaman village. There's the illusory wall that takes you to the abyssal woods. There's the exit out the other side to the church. There's the exit with the golden hippo, which that's the front door. And that's the last one that I did. Yeah. It's the last oh, wow. place I explored in the shadow keep. So like, I, I didn't want to finish the recording without giving them their props for what I think is one of the best levels they've ever made. It's like, it's a marvel of a, of a dungeon. And it's like, it's got it's got all the hits you got the draining the water you've got that was the part that got me when i when yeah. when i was in that flooded area and then i i kind of came to the realization like i think that i'm going to i think this water can be removed and then when i did it and it was like dang this this taking me back to like dark souls again yeah a bunch of messages on the ground that said like uh visions of wraith or something like that yeah from the Londo ruins yeah Yeah. so yeah that just i i think all the legacy dungeons in here are really good even like midra's manse is really small but i thought it was a great visual level to explore for you know a half hour yeah and and then a fun boss fight at the end but the shadow keep is just it's wild yeah couldn't agree more yeah when i when I came back into it, because I went in through the front door and kind of fought through that way. And then 
I found the exit off to the ruins and I was like, well, this doesn't seem right. I haven't like fought a boss yet. I got to keep exploring. So then I kept exploring and eventually found Mesmer and was like, what? He's I met Mesmer already. What's going on? And then after leaving and I kind of like went and explored some other stuff and then I went up kind of found that church and went up into that entrance. And when it said, you know, shadow keep again, when I walked through, I was like, what is happening? How <laughs> Everything <laughs> leads back to the shadow keep. And yeah, it was. And then figuring out that you had to like find another way out to get to the top of the math or top of the map. Cause for so long I was wondering like, when am I going to unlock these top zones that I can see clearly on the map, but I don't, I haven't been able to get there yet. And it's just another like route and pathway through the shadow keep. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's pro it's gotta be one of my favorite dungeons they've ever made. Yeah. 100%. Cool. Well, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up spoilers. We'll take another quick break. And when we come back, we will give our verdicts on Shadow of the Earth Tree. So we are back, and it is time for us to put an official stamp rating on Shadow of the Erd Tree. And the way that we do that on the podcast and on our YouTube channel is with the classic A through F scale, except above A is S. S tier is a masterpiece. F is hot garbage. With all that being said, Dave, as our guest, why don't you kick this thing off? What would you give Shadow of the Erd Tree? So this. This was an interesting journey for me personally, because when we did our Elden Ring podcasts on uh, on Tales from the Backlog, during that month, when you guys came on the show for that episode, and I did three other episodes about Elden Ring that month, partly because it's so long and I do a weekly show, uh, and there's a lot to talk about. So like, we came out of those months, that month of recording saying like Elden Ring is a masterpiece. It's one of the greatest games ever made. It's one of my favorite games ever made. Both of them are true. Uh, and then time starts to pass, and I didn't play Elden Ring in the two years between when I finished it and when the DLC came out. I started a new character and went up through Stormvale Castle just to like remember how to play it. Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason I, there, the reason I didn't play it is because I played the base game so much that like the idea of going back and playing it again was like almost like viscerally repulsive to me. Like it, I, the same <laughs> thing with Skyrim. I played it so much I couldn't yeah. play it anymore. I like my stomach turns if I think about playing Skyrim again. And Elden Ring wasn't at that level, but I did not want to play Elden Ring again. I was I was done. So like. That coupled with the time that passes and you hear the criticisms about the game. And even though I think it's a masterpiece, a masterpiece does not mean it's perfect. It right. is. Yeah, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. So uh, there are flaws with Elden Ring. And so I started to think and you're like, you know, was that recency bias? Is this game as good as I thought it was a week after I finished it? Stuff like that. And then the DLC drops and I get into it and I start playing it again. And like all of those doubts vanish instantly when I start playing it again. I'm like, yes, this is a masterpiece. And the DLC is a masterpiece. It's an S for me personally. Uh, now it aligns with a lot of the things that I like about video games the most. I like exploring. Uh, I like going through cool spaces. I like seeing cool monsters and stuff like that. And like I said at the end of the non-spoiler section, this this game is from software at their best in like the things that they do better than everybody else. So if that aligns with what you want out of a video game, then this is an S, and that's what it is for me. Um, if like I, there are people I know who like bring up very very correct criticisms about like 
the way it mechanically feels to play from software games. Like they're not <laughs> smooth to play. The cameras suck ass from time to time. Like that's all true, but yeah. that is not why I'm here. So it doesn't bother me really at all. Yeah. Uh, and then like we talked about some of those bosses that kind of color our experience in a, you know, shine a, a negative light, we'll say. Uh, but they would have had to have 20 more of those, re- those final bosses for me to think any lesser of this game so for me the things that i value and the things that it does well it aligns so well that i i think that this is a masterpiece it's an s for me no no hesitation dylan how about you i i agree with dave and for me personally it is also an s a masterpiece um i i think that you know obviously games are subjective and so you know if you don't like the kind of games that i like you may not think it's an s but i 100 percent agree like there's just so the the joy of discovery that this game gives coming into new zones finding new weapons items armors learning the story seeing new bosses just getting all of that uh it does it so well and like that's what i am here for in this game and if the base game is anything to go off of i'm sure there's stuff that i missed that i didn't see that i you know have yet to discover because in my recent playthrough of the base game uh, i was using kind of like a walkthrough to like try to collect all of the things so that i have like a character that i can respec and just kind of use any weapon that i want to and there was a ton of like not a ton a ton but there were definitely things in every single zone that i had never seen before and i had put hundreds of hours into the game it, i i just think that it is so cool that it can constantly give you that sense of discovery maybe not as often uh as the first time you experience it but it it's still it has legs and it is a very solid fun game there were like we talked about more in the the spoiler section there were some of those bosses that felt like they maybe crossed that line from fair but challenging into frustrating but cha- and challenging at the same time i do think a lot of that stems just from at least in my for me personally from like not liking that the options for beating them were either get good or spec into this cheesy thing and uh, like the the freedom being taken there does kind of suck but at the same time i do think that like dave said had that been every boss i i i think this wouldn't be an s but because it was the rare boss in the game uh as you know out of the 40 bosses or whatever it was maybe four or five of them that were that level of frustrating It's like, yeah, that's not a bad ratio. That's not like every single boss in uh, Sekiro for me. (laughs) So, (laughs) so yeah, that's that's kind of where I am, though. Uh, So S for me. So like we talked about, you guys have referenced in the spoiler section, uh, discussing the bosses and the frustration, kind of ending the experience on a little bit of a sour note. I was I had been kicking around like, what did I want to rate? the deals the the expansion is shadow of the earth tree is it as good as the base game and i think that a couple things have helped me decide where i'm going to rank it and one of those things is um you know talking to you guys and being reminded about things like how cool the level design was and how awesome some of these dungeons were and some of the boss designs and new weapons and just kind of rem- remembering kind of what you said the ratio of like things that didn't that i didn't love versus things that i really enjoyed i think that definitely is going to uh, be a major factor in what i end up giving this game and then the second thing is when this game when shadow of the earth tree launched i gorged on this game in a way that i have not played a video game in maybe since (laughs) elden ring came out Mm -hmm. yeah like i had the like double-edged sword of being fortunate and unfortunate enough to like get sick and call out from work for a day um like the week like the monday after it came out so i just i played this game like all weekend long you know with the exception of having to actually do some 
adult responsibility things here and there. But like anytime I had the minute or like the chance to play it, I was playing it. Anytime I wasn't playing it, I was thinking about it. And that just doesn't really happen to that level that often for games anymore for me. And so when I think about that fact and how like addicted is probably like a negative word to use, but just like how in this game I was when it came out, I it it's an S for me as well. Like I, mm-hmm. I do think that there are some some frustrating moments and some things and trends that we talked about that I would like to see changed or, you know, not become the norm moving forward. But yeah, this the base game was truly special. This expansion is more of that base game and it's more in the sense that it it is more it's this, you play it the same way and all that, but it's also like more. They stepped it up. They did some things in there that were truly special. And yeah, overall, I had a great time with it. I I would say like along those lines that the things that the base game did really well are they're better in the DLC. So there are some things that like the base game didn't do well that the DLC also doesn't do well. But, you know, for those really important things, uh, for the most part, I I think the DLC is better than the base game, which is a, a crazy thing to think about with how much we all loved the base game. And yeah. like not assuming that you agree with everything I just said, but for me personally, that's where I'm at. Like, for the things that from software does well this this is some of the best work they've ever done yeah well i as we were talking and talking about like trends and boss fights and stuff i was thinking like you know that could maybe be a topic episode so maybe maybe this isn't the last we'll talk about shadow of the Erd tree but it is kind of the official closing of the book on elden ring and Super glad that you joined us for this conversation, Dave. It was great to have you back on the show talking about From Software Games. Um, I mentioned it at the beginning of the episode, but you host a couple of podcasts. You have Tales from the Backlog, which you know is your your big, beefy video game podcast that you do, and then you also host a top three. So why don't you take an opportunity to talk about what you've been up to recently, plug your stuff, where can people find you, uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you guys again for having me back on uh, to talk about Elden Ring. As you know, if if this is somebody's first time listening to me talk on a podcast, I hope you can tell <laughs> how much I love the work that From Software does. So any chance I get to talk about it, uh, especially with people like you two, is, uh, it's an honor. So thank you again. And then my my shows, I host Tales from the Backlog. That's the main big project that takes up the majority of my my time, my free time, <laughs> if we're being honest. And that's a weekly gaming deep dive show. Every episode is about one game. And sometimes I do topic discussions too, but it's mostly those single game episodes. And uh, every episode is like this episode was structured today is a no spoiler section before so anyone can listen to any episode uh, and then we do the spoiler break we warn you that spoilers are coming and then you can leave and go play that game or just avoid the spoilers if you don't want it most of the games i focus on on the show are not brand new uh i'm not i'm also not a retro show i'm just kind of like playing the games i have and Sometimes I play new games and they go on the show and my workflow means that those episodes come out six months after those games release. So it's not like a what's coming out this week type of show. It's, it's you know, it's in the name, Tales from the Backlog. So lately on the show, uh, I did do my own episode about this DLC, but you've heard my opinion. So other stuff uh, that's coming <laughs> on Tales from the Backlog we're recording this in July, so stuff in July. Uh, we have uh, Lisa the Painful. We had 1,000 Times Resist, which was one of my favorites from 2024. Uh, Grease, Cocoon, and then the uh, last yeah. episode of July is Metal Gear Solid 3. Uh, so that's a big episode there. So that nice. should give you an idea of like the types of games that I'm playing is, you know, not necessarily retro, but definitely not like what's new this week. So... That's that show. And again, at the top, Andrew mentioned the uh, the episodes that we've all done together. We tier ranked the Bloodborne bosses. We talked about Elden Ring and the open world uh, design. 
and then open world games as a whole in that episode. We did The Witcher 2, and then Andrew and Katie were on for Near Automata. So lots of uh, visits from your friendly neighborhood gamers on Tales from the Backlog. Then my other show, a top three podcast, is a much quicker pitch. We do top three lists. It's a comedy <laughs> show. We do some video game top threes from time to time. But like, if anyone ever wants to listen to hear me talk about things that are not games, that's the show. So... Uh, we do top three lists. We draft topics too. A recent episode we recorded was drafting our last meals uh, from foods that the community submitted. So we didn't get to pick per se. We just had to make do with what we got. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> it's a comedy show. And if if you think that I have the capacity to be funny, uh, that's that's a show to check out. <laughs> so those are my two shows. You can find them just on your favorite podcast app. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter also at real dave jackson uh and i'm also in the friendly neighborhood gamers discord uh pretty often so you'll see me in there yeah. yes absolutely and uh if you like deep dives if you like if you enjoy our deep dive episodes or like listening to game specific conversations in your podcast uh, dave is like the deepest diver so <laughs> yeah you, you go check that out for sure i yep. appreciate it pretty much find a game that you like listen to dave's episode on it that is because he's probably done at least one one episode about a game that you like because he's mm -hmm. he's got quite the backlog of tales from the backlog too yep. so yeah yeah and if you again if you, if you find a game you've always been curious about and you want to know like what is this game about what why why is it special or why is it not special you can listen to that episode because again no spoilers for a while yeah for sure it's a great format, and that's why we copied it. <laughs> <laughs> Imitation's the most sincere uh, form of flattery, as they say. As exactly. they say. Uh, let's see. As far as us, your friendly neighborhood gamers, we um, Dave mentioned our Discord server. That's the best place to come hang out with us, chat with us. If you want to talk to us about Elden Ring, we have a dedicated Elden Ring channel. Um, so that would be the best place to come hang out, talk about video games, talk about movies, whatever. Um, we're also on social media. We're on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all of those places, X. Uh, but if you actually want to come and like have genuine conversations and hang out with us or people that have been on the show or other just members of the community, like Discord is the best place to do that. So that's why I like to plug it a little bit more heavily. Uh, as far as the podcast goes, if you enjoyed this episode, if you like our content, leave us a rating. We'd really appreciate it. Helps us quite a bit. Dylan, what's going on on YouTube? Uh, all, if you are listening to this podcast on YouTube or watching it on YouTube, ratings are great, but also maybe leave a comment and a like on this video. But then also we do have shorter form content on YouTube that you may be interested in checking out. You're already here after all. So uh, <laughs> I think recently we've had an update on our fantasy critic league. Uh, I guess if you listen to the podcast regularly, that's probably like that was a recent episode. So you don't need that short video. Yeah. And on the YouTube channel, we spoke with Dave about Elden Ring when it came that's out. That's true. That was yeah. not a short review thing that was essentially like a video <laughs> podcast well we la like yeah 30 we minutes it, 45 minutes something yeah like we that. labeled it a quick review but it was 45 minutes whereas most of our other quick reviews are five uh <laughs> so com compared to the like two-ish hours we've spent talking about just the expansion that's pretty yes. quick but I, I was gonna how did you guys wrangle me into only 45 minutes <laughs> about Elden I, Ring? i would have to go watch it to <laughs> yeah. remember i don't know i don't yeah. know how we did it but we also have some some a good bit of like Dark Souls content on the YouTube channel now after Dark Souls month. And then we also have uh, I've done videos on Lies of P and Mortal Shell. So if you want to kind of branch out into other Souls like games, if Elden Ring has given you the itch and you want to check out some maybe smaller or non from soft experiences, we have uh, some videos about those you can go check out and uh, see if maybe they're right for you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that is it for this episode. Again, thank you so much for coming on, Dave. Really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to this episode. We really appreciate that as well. And we will catch you on the next one.